want to talk about faith. Why faith? <coughs> and for me, this is a very important platform to engage with you people. You see that? Because most of you have not had one on one with you. So, this is a very important platform for the Holy Spirit as I speak to you to use this word to, 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 to pierce your hearts and transform your hearts and to position you and to connect you with the voice of the Lord. You see that? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that you may now also propel yourself in the same rhythm. You see that? Because of time. At the end of this week, we're going to be in Rwanda. So, again, we can only do this up to now. You see that? Mm -hmm. But all through, I've been longing to talk about faith. Why? Because I found out that among the things, that among the elements that are critical in the Christian walk, faith is key. Absolutely key. The Lord allowed me to see that faith was champion, was very key. And that's why I thought I can begin a series on faith, so we can begin this dialogue on faith, you know, this discourse on faith. And in the process, the Lord is going to explore and open up and unveil much about faith. And you are going to see, very, as I begin to walk on this road, you're going to even see the genesis of the current state of the church. You see the bearing of faith onto the church. How faith can make or break the church depending on whether you have it or not or whether it grows or dwindles, whatever, we're going to handle that here. Okay? The role of faith in the church. I thought this was very basic, important teaching. Back to basics. That when the church catches, then she can catch her bearing back to the Lord. Now, while talking about faith, there is no better place to begin except to begin with Abraham. Again, I'm saying that while talking about faith, there is no better place from which to commence this journey except to begin with Abraham. Why? Why begin with Abraham, precious people? I'm going to read a scripture that you may understand why we would prefer to start from Abraham as we talk about faith. And it's my prayer that this, these are some of the words you'll use when you talk to your congregations. Hallelujah. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 15. And I have quite 50 scriptures. We may never do them even in 10 series, right? Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15. Once you're there, say Amen. Amen. And I am going to read from Amplified Version of the Bible, purposefully, that we may open up certain very important aspects of this discussion, right? Yes. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, I'm reading from Amplified. Listen to what he says, Amplified. He says, And he, Abraham, Believed in, trusted in, relied on, remained steadfast to the Lord. <laughs> and he says again, and he, Abraham, believed in, if I were you making the notes out, right? Believe in, or believed in. Trusted in, relied on, remained steadfast to the Lord. And he counted it to him, he the Lord, capital H. He the Lord counted it to him 
as righteousness, right standing with God. I want to begin from there. Hallelujah. Yes. Why did I begin from Abraham? Because the Lord, the God of heaven, when it came to faith, he decreed by his infinite wisdom in heaven, he declared that behold, because of the act of Abraham, he is now the father of faith of all humanity. Did you understand me? Let me go back here. I began from Abraham because God Almighty declared when he looked at the interaction that he had with Abraham. Then he said, Behold, you are now the father of faith to all human beings. And that's why the Bible celebrates Abraham as the father of faith. But when we see the conduct, the demeanor, the behavior of Abraham that earned him that title, that crowning as the father of human faith, then therein we find the definition of faith. You see that now? Because you see, now the Lord defining faith. So if you asked me today to define faith, I would just find it from the Bible. I would say, based on what Abraham did to earn him the name, the title, the exaltation as the father of faith, then faith is, number one, believing God. That's it. Believing God. Again, faith then becomes believing God. But what I've said is so big, precious people. I said, if there is any definition of faith that I would begin with as we begin the journey to define faith, then I say, faith, where I have faith in my God, I have faith in the Lord, that means I believe God. Believe in Him. Believe in God. That is the basic definition of faith I can give you from the Bible. In fact, that's where He began. But I can read other things from what I just said that believe in God. When somebody says to you, look, I believe Bishop Dr. Njoro. That means, again, I've just said it with me. That means you have faith in him. Yes. But having faith in Bishop Dr. Njoro also means I take him for his word. Yes. Mm -hmm. I can take him for his word. He says it. I don't need a collateral. I don't need to hold on to surety. Collateral. To be sure that you know this, what he says is right. When he says, I take him for his word. So when you say that faith, the Christian faith, faith in the body of Christ is believing God. Then that means you take God for his word. Yes. Period. Nothing else. You don't need a proof of any collateral. Let me hold on to this when it's fulfilled. Or let me hold on to this. To, 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 you see that? Hallelujah. Amen. But in this, same, in this same scripture, other definitions. Other definitions are true, right? Mm -hmm. Because say, believing him, you say, verse 6. He says, and he, Abraham, believed in him, believed in, believed God, believed in God, believed in the Lord. He believed in, trusted in. That means faith implies trusting. <laughs> you can now see where we're headed to with the church. You will very soon see the current fall in the church and the genesis of it. Where it all began. Why it fell. Hallelujah. Amen. Step by step. So he's now telling us here. That having faith in the Lord. Means trusting the Lord. Yes. I trust the Lord. 
<laughs> you see where things went wrong. Hmm? Hmm? Furthermore, he goes on to give me more and more unveiling for me, and I'm reading from Amplified. He's like, believe in God, trusting in God, and it goes on for further to say, listen to what he says, and he says, relying on God. Ah! I've said three big words that actually that cushion faith, that denote faith, that when you touch, they, they feel you can feel the texture of faith from those three words. I've said belief, believe in God. That is faith. And I've said that means trusting God. And I've also said relying on God. When you rely on somebody, that means that is the only person you depend on. I relied on him. I relied on this person. That means I had no other options. I surrendered everything else. All the other options, I relied on this. I depend. Ah, why am I going ahead of me? I depended on him. Are you seeing where the problem in the church came about? Yes. Huh? That means faith is such an important foundation of Christianity, of salvation, to the extent that faith actually is what molds us and propels us to number one, to now look at God as believable, trustable, Dependable, reliable. Oh, I think there is a problem in the church. Based on th just this basic definition, I hear the undertones, you know. I hear the undertones of where the problem is. You see that? Why the apostasy entered the church? Because if I understood it right, relying on, <laughs> it does. I, that's totally surrendered to the waiting on this one. There's no other. There's no other. You see that? Hmm? Yeah. And right away, as I move down to the next one, you can almost see the enemies of faith. You can see them trying to shoot through. You see that? Disbelief. Yeah. Whatever. I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm going to come to there. I'm going to come to there. Believe you me, we will handle this thing in greater depth. And we cannot even handle it in 10 series. I'm just beginning this. But you see very clearly, just based on the basic biblical definition of faith, you can already see where the faulting is. You see that? You can already check the fault lines. You see where the fault lines are split. You see that? And separated. You see that? The church from the mainstream. Yes. <laughs> the blood. Hmm? But, in continuing... I see more unveiling about faith. I have not begun anything. I just want us to understand what is faith? What is faith? And if it is so important, how is our faith? We are going to come there then. <laughs> In fact, you will see a lot about faith. You will hear him say things like, daughter, your faith has healed you. So we are really going very far. Don't even worry. But just Still in the definition, you already see a lot of things coming through. You see that? You see that? Wow. So we ought to have believed God. To, to believe God means whatever he says, finished. I believe it. Yes. There's nothing else. Yes. We ought to have trusted God. Oh, and if we trusted 100%, we will not be here. You see all that coming through now. Yes. We ought to have relied on. The church today has relied on another relied on otherwise relied on else you can already see where we're headed to you can already see where the problem is huh you say and he says depending on you see that we suppose depend on meaning life and death it is this one here huh only one way he says i can begin to see the one way traffic that faith molds in our lives. And this is a big, um, a big, it, it shouts a question, it's a screaming question, you know, to the church today. Where is our faith? How is our faith? What is the state of our faith? Hmm? Is it well and alive? Whatever. We're going to share that, right? 
But going further on, he still denotes, he defines faith by saying, yeah, believing, it is believing in the Lord, trusting in the Lord, relying on the Lord, remaining steadfast to the Lord. Oh, that's so powerful. That's very powerful, precious people. Because now he says, remaining steadfast to. He says, remaining steadfast to. Yes. Steadfast yes. to. Holding, which means re remaining kishikilia yeah. evil. Remaining steadfast to. I hold it. Eh? Mm. As life and death. Yes. That already tells me about something else. When he says remaining steadfast to, which means the, in this own definition of faith, there is a danger of drifting. Yes. Of failing to remain steadfast. I can see that shouting through. Right? The failure of remaining steadfast. Which we, oh, you say remaining steadfast to. Remain, please. Also, in that first exploration of faith, by defining it as remaining steadfast to the Lord, I can quickly unearth, I can, I can dig out a lot of things in the Bible about what am I remaining steadfast on? He said, unto the Lord. You know? yes. But how can you, how do you remain steadfast to the Lord? When he says, remain steadfast to, to your faith, uh, rather to the Lord, that means there is a temporal situation here. There is a time zone. Does yes. somebody hear me? Yes. There is a time, a, a, a time element here. Remain steadfast too. Which means over time don't change. Don't lose grip. Do you understand me? Number one, I mean, I don't know which number it is, but obviously what shouts through is the danger of losing grip. You see that? Number two, the way you hold grip to what you... It seems as if the church, the body of Christ, was given something to remain steadfast to. And now I can open up what that is. Hallelujah. Yes. When you discuss faith, then it can come through. Why? Can I open up what that is that you should remain steadfast yes. to? Yes. Before I come back to, to, to finish up with Genesis... Yes. It is remaining steadfast to the works of the cross. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Did you understand? <laughs> because there's a time zone here. Yes. You say remain, which means you be there like that. Yes. Don't lose it. Like as if I'm going away. You understand? But you remain steadfast to this. As I come back, let me find you still holding on to it. I'm just exploring faith with you people. The basic understanding of faith. The biblical understanding of faith. So that we may now be able to probe, to reinterrogate, to review the state of faith in the church. Could it have been the reason there is a fall? Because I've said it many times, especially to pastors like you, that if you find a place where a pastor turns around and begins to preach money, and he says, sow a seed and get a miracle. Sow a seed and get this. Sow a seed and get this. Begin to sell the blood of Jesus. Beginning to do the ill practice, the, 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 the lawlessness, the practice of lawlessness in the sanctuary. Then, I always say this. Since we, we have been sent to, do, to deal to deal in the matters of faith. To preach to them that they may have faith yes. in Him. How can we ourselves lose faith or not have faith? Because the Bible says, He said in the Bible, don't worry what I will eat, what I will drink, where I will sleep, or what. He says, the birds, if you look at the birds in the sky, they never have granaries and stores. But your father feeds them on a perpetual, on a daily basis without fail. Whether it rains or sunshine, he feeds them on a daily basis. And then he says, look at the lilies, how they are clothed. And he says, even King Solomon, in the splendor of his wealth and majesty, he could not rival the lilies. You understand? Yes. So, I see very clearly that there, the Lord is speaking to the church. He is speaking to the servants. And what is the Lord saying? He's saying, look, 
I have said, I will not let you down. Because he said, how much more than you who are his servants shall he fend for you? Yes. You understand? Yes. So, if faith means believing God, that also means believing him and taking him for his word. Yes. I take him for his word. On his word. To have faith. You see that? And so, if you find somebody trying to corrupt the gospel, it is a pathetic state of fall. In fact, it, 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 it exudes faithlessness. That means they reach a point of not having faith in the Lord to the extent that now they have to corrupt. They have to try by their own means. You understand? That's why I said faith is so key. I have to talk about faith. I must. And I said that when it comes to the definition of faith according to the Bible, he says, believing, you, you know, it, it's as if the only way you can glorify God, the only manner in which the Lord can be glorified by the body of Christ, by the church, by the pastors, by the priesthood, by the pulpit, is when the body of Christ has faith in the Lord. Then he will be honored. Why do I say so? Why have I said such a big thing? Because in the biblical definition I've read, it's as if he's saying, when you have faith in the Lord, that means you are declaring to the nation that look, that Lord, the Lord of heaven, he is believable. The Lord of heaven, he is reliable. The Lord of heaven is dependable. The Lord of heaven is... Uh, you understand me? <laughs> In so doing, that's what you're shouting to the nations. And you're glorifying him. Because you're telling people, look, come, my God is dependable. You can entirely depend on him. He is believable. He is trustworthy, trustable. But when it comes down to where the Bible says, holding steadfast to the Lord, then I want to understand, what is this tangibility? What is the tangible thing that we must hold, not to lose across time when we have faith? What is this that faith will help us to, to lay our hands on and hold? I know he says, Remaining steadfast to the Lord. But I want to break it up. I want to bring it in digestible portions to you. Synthesizable. That you may understand deeper what the Lord is talking about here when he's talking about faith in the body of Christ. Faith in the church. For you to understand what the church ought to hold steadfast to, I said we must understand that it's about the cross, the works of the cross. You understand? But let me, let me move on in a better way that you may understand it better. Turn with me temporarily. We're coming back to Genesis. Turn with me to the book of John chapter 3, verse 16. Hallelujah. John chapter 3, verse 16. John chapter 3, verse 16. What is this the Lord is asking us to hold steadfast to? John chapter 3, 16. How do we understand faith in the body of Christ? So that we may now be able to probe us, to probe we, to probe ourselves with that understanding of faith and then ask ourselves, where is our faith? How far is it? Has it grown? Is it big or is it dwindling, diminishing or whatever? You see that? <clears throat> he says, for God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten unique son so that whoever believes in him trusts in him clings to him relies on him shall not perish come to destruction and be lost but have eternal, everlasting life. 
<laughs> that's so mighty, right? Yes. I thought that's very big. Did somebody see what I saw? Yes. Huh? Very fast, you begin to understand the bearing of faith into your salvation. I mean, the centrality of faith. Huh? How faith is actually the epicenter of your Christian salvation. Because I'm amazed. And you know, Amplified does it in a beautiful way. When he does it about the cross, I see him defining faith. I see him exalting faith. Raising faith, which means God in heaven, when he saw the fall of man, when Jehovah saw that the church had now fallen, let me go back to the Garden of Eden. At the Garden of Eden, there was something very important that took place there. When God created man, he created man in his own image and likeness. Again, in his likeness and image, right? Yes. But that image of God and likeness of the Lord is not physical. Because we know that the Lord never dies. The Lord is not perishable. The Lord is not corruptible. The Lord is not mortal. So that image must have been imperishable, immortal, incorruptible. And yet the flesh we wear, we know it too well that it is very perishable, corruptible, and mortal, dies. So if I look very clearly, into the original blueprint of the creation of the church. When in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, which we are not reading today, the Lord designed the blueprint, the spiritual architectural blueprint for the creation of man, for creating the church. He designed the church in such a way that at the end of his finishing, when he's doing the finishing of the work now, the finishings, when he's doing the finishings, you'd end up with the image and likeness of God. It doesn't matter where he started from. Molded, created what ended up with the flesh now, and then he put in the spirit. That's why I said the finishings. In that spirit, there is an aspect of that spirit that is supposed to be immortal, that is supposed to be imperishable, incorruptible. What is that aspect, precious people? That aspect is the one and only righteousness of the Lord. I, I'm not jumping the gun, please. I'm just mentioning this to calm it down and then so you are aware and then bring you back. You see that? Why have I said so? Because in the Garden of Eden, we know that Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. It's very well documented in the Bible that in the cool of the day, Adam walked with God. And there is no way mankind in the Garden of Eden would have sustained such a close proximity to the Lord. Such a very close relationship with the Lord except that he was walking in righteousness. Did you understand me? Only righteousness could, because we know that our God is holy. Our God is righteous. And the only thing about him that is eternal and eternal and eternal and never changes, will never change, is the righteousness of God. The holiness of the Lord. 
So even then, he was very holy. And there is no way Adam, mankind, the church, would have walked with God if the church were not walking righteousness. So when he created man, he intended that man be righteous. Did you understand me? And when man fell, when man fell, when Adam and Eve fell at the garden of Eden, what is it that they lost? They lost the righteousness of the Lord. That was the biggest and eternal treasure that had been deposited in the soul of man. That is what caused the Lord to say the right say, the image and likeness of God, the eternity of God, that man may share in the eternity of God. And yet we know it too well that only the righteousness of the Lord can bestow upon a soul eternity with God. Let me move it to another level. Now, the fall in the Garden of Eden. We have seen the fall now. That they fell and in the falling, the fall was to lose righteousness. You see that? But listen very carefully now. Come John chapter 3 verse 16 that we just read. Again I read it. He says, for God so greatly loved and, de and dearly prized the world, which means appraised, raised the value, dearly prized, raised the value of the world, which means the value had gone down. He loved and he raised its value, the value of the earth, the value of men, the value of the world. He says, and dearly prized the world that he even, he even, gave up his only begotten unique son so that whoever believes in him whoever trusts in him whoever clings to him relies on him shall not perish and come to destruction or be lost but have eternal everlasting life listen to this focus on me what is the Lord saying in other words about Calvary the Lord is saying that from heaven at the throne of God the value of faith is so high so treasured that God was able to even release his one only begotten son that whoever will have faith down there may not die but come in here. Amen. Did somebody hear me? Yes. That the value of faith before the throne of God, this faith we are talking about, is so big that when he brought Jesus, said, whoever believes in him, relies on him, trusts him, but we know that that's the definition of faith. Those are the dimensions that denote faith, that develop the boundary of faith. That faith is such a premium before God in heaven to the extent that God Almighty was able to release his one and only unique begotten son to go down there and be tortured and to be killed to pay the full price the ultimate price why that whoever will have faith down there I may not leave them that they may enter here and be saved you see the value of faith are you beginning to understand me? Yes. So you see that when Adam was walking in the garden of Eden and the Lord said, you shall not eat of the tree from the fruits of the tree in the center of the garden. Adam, when he was walking with God in the cool of the day, Adam believed God. Meaning he was in right standing with God. Adam believed God, which means he had faith in God. Adam trust 
trusted God which means Adam had faith in the Lord Adam obeyed God everything which means Adam took God for his word yes 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 yes, yes. 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 he had faith but when the devil came the adversary the enemy came what did the enemy meddle with he meddled with faith that is where he touched knowing the premium that is attached to faith in the kingdom of god the devil had to come and touch faith and disrupt faith and diminish faith and dwindle faith and bring in the enemy of faith doubt and ask him is it really true that he said in other words creating a doubt is it really true that he said that if you eat from that tree you will have the knowledge of good and bad and will have death or whatever huh? and look at the mistake here instead of Adam and Eve taking God for his word which means having faith in God sustaining holding steadfast to the faith they had in God instead of them remaining steadfast in the faith that allowed them to walk in the cool of the day with the Lord which means believing God which means taking him for his word Adam and Eve went into the business of trying to test to test the word of God <laughs> did you hear me somebody yes. listen again very carefully when you just believe God I believe God faith means to believe God just believe God which means I don't need any collateral I don't need any surety any bond to, to hold back something to, to fall back to I just believe him which means if I just believe him which means I also believe his word yes. anything he says I just take it as yes, yes it, does. it is done yes. he has said it I don't need to question or prove it but they moved position from there and they went to test God to test now the word God has spoken the devil began to ask them is it true the Lord said this and then they went to test between right and evil and touch the fruit they said let us see really if what he said you understand yes. do you understand the centrality of faith yes. do you understand where the fall is yes. Yes. do you understand the genesis of the fall yes. Yes. and do you understand that the devil has never changed tactic Okay. That is the same tool he has used to now bring down the church today. Yes. The faithlessness, the loss of faith, the diminishing of faith, the incorporation of doubt. Hallelujah. Amen. Listen very carefully. They went to try out, took it and ate to try out. But guess what? What is the Lord saying here? From that point on, they were thrown out. Death entered the earth. The cherubim of glory with flaming swords were put in the eastern gate to make sure they never enter to eat the tree of life that would allow them to live forever. Because death had come. Death came as a penalty. So what is the Lord saying here? The Lord is saying that faith is so highly prized in heaven to the extent that if you are faithless or if you lose your faith the penalty is death did somebody understand the gravity of faith that faith is so critical to our god jehovah the god of israel faith is all or nothing faith is so critical to him that he could surrender his only son for those with faith it is so critical that whoever loses faith, the penalty is death. The
There is no intermediary. There is no midway. That's how death was pronounced upon mankind. But look at this. When Adam and Eve, when humanity at the Garden of Eden, when mankind lost faith and fell, you understand me? Look at this now. Fell by eating from the tree. You understand? Yes. Then the Lord now, because of the way he cherishes faith, he pr highly prizes faith before himself at the throne. And hence the faithful. Because of the heavy price on faith, he now releases his one and only begotten son to come back to restore faith that whoever believes in him, whoever trusts him, whoever relies on him, whoever clings to him, whoever holds steadfast on him shall not die anymore but enter. Amen. Death is erased. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now death is erased out of the restoration of faith. The garden of Eden fell, lost faith and ate from the tree. From the tree came the curse, that tree. When he came now at Calvary, restored faith on the tree. Amen. Listen to me. When they ate at the Garden of Eden, they ate the fruit of the tree. It brought death. But at Calvary, when we ate the fruit of the tree, we found life. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Lord, He really helped us. Do you see the significance of faith? Yes. So Jesus came to restore faith. That's why they, they call it the Christian faith. Did you understand? Salvation is the Christian faith. This is what I want you to teach in your churches. Because in the first scripture that we saw, Genesis chapter 15 verse 6, look at what he said. Just look at what he said there. Back to Genesis 15 verse 6. That we may understand another dimension, another aspect of faith, and how critical and significant faith is in our salvation. That hence, we may cherish faith we may guard faith. We may hold steadfast to faith. Protect faith. Never lose faith. He says, verse 6 again, we're still on the same verse. He says, And he, Abraham, believed in, trusted in, relied on, remained steadfast to the Lord, and he counted it to him, as righteousness, right standing with God. That is so powerful. That means that this so much cherished and beloved righteousness of the Lord is actually a manifestation of faith. Did somebody hear me? Yes. In other words, I'm now seeing a, a, a higher notch of what faith stands for in the body of Christ. Because he says that because Abraham had faith by believing God, trusting God, depending on God, and, and relying on God, then God counted it to him that behold, he is now righteous. Yes. That means when the church walks in faith, believes in the Lord, has faith in the Lord, that church 
manifests righteousness. That is just how central faith is at the throne of God. That faith equals to righteousness. And since we know that righteousness equals to the kingdom of God, eternity with God, the rapture of the church, the wedding of the Lamb, then that means faith equals the kingdom of God. That means faith is the only avenue through which humanity, the church, can access the exploits of the cross at Calvary. Again, that means faith is the only roadmap through which humanity, the church, can access the kingdom of God. Faith is the only avenue through which mankind can access eternal peace at the wedding feast of the Lamb of God. The rapture. Peace with God. Worship in heaven. Escaping hell. Faith equals the rapture. Faith equals the kingdom of God. And if faith equals to the righteousness of the church, then that tells me that when the Lord says, please prepare your garments, his meaning, hold steadfast to your faith. So now you understand that when the Lord said that the garment of the bride of Christ is spotless without, without spot yes. without stain yes. without wrinkle yes. he actually alluded to the faith of that church he implied her faith that her faith would never have a speck of a doubt mm -hmm. and that's why he says that when anybody anyone stands before a mountain and tell that big mountain, be ye removed from here and thrown and cast into the ocean. And he has faith and he completely believes without a doubt that that mountain will be removed and cast into the ocean. Do you now understand what the Lord said? That the final church the church that enters the kingdom of God is a church that will be in the unity of the faith. Faith is such a treasure in the kingdom of God, it cannot be overlooked in the church. And now we see that actually faith, a church that is faithful to God, is indeed a church that is righteous to God. She's walking in the righteousness of the Lord. Because in simple human terms, when somebody says that, look, my wife is faithful to me, that means he trusts his wife. And if he trusts his wife, that means he really loves his wife. And she really loves him. That means there is not a speck of doubt. That means there is a covenant between the two which is very strong. So faith in the body of Christ actually denotes a very strong covenant that is there between Christ and the church such that a faithful church is the church that is strongly covenanted bonded to the Lord huh, that's very powerful 
Because when somebody is faithful to another, there is a relationship there. There is honor to that relationship. There is the prizing, the raising, exalting of that relationship above all the others that could have interfered with it. That's why it is sustained. So when the Lord explores faith with us, the Lord talks about faith in the body, the body of Christ. In other words, it throws in a begging question, right? When he says, have you truly prized the covenant that I unleashed at Calvary? Again, have you really exalted before the eyes of men, before the eyes of the world, that mighty covenant that I invoked on the cross at Calvary. So, in a nutshell, you begin to understand the genesis of the apostasy in today's church. That apostasy the waywardness, the lawlessness that we see heavily manifest in the church today can only symbolize a church that has lost faith in the Lord. That means if the pastors are corrupting to get money to fend for themselves, which means they have lost faith that the Lord can provide. If you see churches and ministries where miracles are being faked, that means they have lost faith that the Lord can heal. Faith is everything in the church. And if today's church, today's postmodern fallen church, if she is to be able to retrace her origins, retrace her path back to what she received in the beginning, to what she was supposed to hold steadfast to, then she has to ask the Lord to restore her faith. It is the faith she lost that caused the decay in the body of Christ. Without faith, the church has no business because we are in the business of faith, of making people have faith in Christ. Without faith, the church has no future with God in heaven. That is just how central and how significant faith is in the Christian lifestyle. Faith is indeed the foundation of all Christian work. Because we have now seen that even the righteousness we need to wear is actually a pre, is in fact a byproduct. Faith is a precursor of righteousness. That you cannot walk in righteousness except that you have faith. You are faith, and when you have faith, you are faithful to the Lord. Did you understand? Yes. Again, let me repeat this. This is very important. You cannot walk in righteousness except that you have faith which means you are faithful to the Lord faithful means you cannot break the covenant yes. you cannot dare yes. faithful means you trust so much you treasure you understand 
For me, you know what? I cannot do all those things because I love the Lord so much that I have to remain faithful to Him. You understand? Mm -hmm. So, the only thing that the church needs to restore today, what she needs to restore today, is faith. If the church is going to... Because Jesus came. Jesus came to Calvary. At the cross. To restore that which was lost at, at the Garden of Eden. And we found that because they walked in the cool of the day with the Lord, they must have been righteous before the fall. Because the Lord, He is righteous. But when they fell, and if there's anything they lost that cast them out of God's presence, at the Garden of Eden, then it was righteousness. Yes. And since we have seen that only faithfulness can yield righteousness, then that means they lost righteousness. Yes. And when Jesus comes in John chapter 3, verse 16, to restore that which was lost at Calvary, we see the first thing he restores is faith. That whoever believes in him, that whoever relies on him, that whoever depends on him, that whoever clings on him shall not perish, be destroyed or lost, but inherit eternal everlasting life with him. So, when Jesus brought back righteousness, he clothed it in faith. Faith is the carrier of the righteousness of Jehovah. Shalom, the Lord bless you.